You're listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR, Reality Check Radio. Ezra Levant is a Canadian conservative media personality, political activist, writer, broadcaster, and a former lawyer. Ezra is the co-founder, owner, and CEO of what the elites call a far-right media website, Rebel News. He's affectionately known as the Rebel Commander, though I'm not sure how he'd look in an orange flight suit or maybe flying an X-Wing fighter. He's here in New Zealand to help launch RV Mini's new book before jetting out to Melbourne. It's his first time in New Zealand, so here's a warm welcome to New Zealand from Reality Check Radio. Welcome to New Zealand, Ezra. Cam, it's great to be here. Is this your first time in New Zealand, Ezra? It is, and I'm looking forward to it. I've visited Australia before, but of course, New Zealand is an entirely different world, and I'm delighted to be in Auckland today. We're going to Wellington um, later. Hopefully, I'll have a chance to tour around a little. So it's um, it's not a very long visit, but I'm already having a great time. Uh- it's great to have you here, and it's. Uh, I've been following yourself and Rebel News and the growth uh, and also the trials and tribulations that you've been through in Canada and also Australia with Avi for quite some time. So it's going to be a real pleasure to finally meet you in person and uh, at Avi's book launch on, on Friday night. Well, thanks very much for your kind words, and the feeling's mutual. I know it's tough to be a citizen journalist like you are, when you're competing against not just the corporate media, but increasingly the government media, not just government funded, but in many ways, government directed. And um, to be a nonconformist, to be contrarian, to be skeptical, those used to be traits of all journalists, but it's sort of being drummed out of the profession. So I, I salute you. You're one of the few lonely voices in this country fighting back against what I call the regime media. <laughs> Regime media, that's appropriate because you know, I uh, I labelled the Ardern government as a regime because of the excesses um, under COVID of uh, what they had, very similar to what you had in Canada and, and almost identical to what Dan Andrews did to Victoria uh, that Avi and Rukshan had to deal with. And uh, they really were regimes. Uh, so I think it's the only way that we can describe it and this global creep of controlling information you know the internet was supposed to give us freedom of information and now they're seeking to control it yeah well i'm glad you mentioned avi and rukshan they really were uh lonely voices in one of the worst lockdown cities in the world melbourne Mm -hmm. australia and as you know avi was literally arrested stomped to the ground, thrown in the back of a police truck, driven far away. I think it might have been even five times altogether. And uh, eventually they apologized to him, um, but not until after we took them to court, which most people don't have the financial ability or even the know-how. How do you sue the government? It's an impossible thing. Mm. And so, so Avi fought back. But for every guy who fought back, there's got to be 10 or 100 who couldn't fight back, didn't fight back. And, and the whole reason they went, they go after guys like Avi is to make people think, wow, if they can do that to Avi, they can for sure do that to me. So it's sort of a demoralization tactic to really make an example out of nonconformists. So I listen, I mean, you don't want to be contrarian just for being contrarian's sake. Although, frankly, I like people like that because they <laughs> force you to check your uh check your biases but these days there's such a conformity um i use the phrase regime media some people say legacy media i don't even know if i'd say mainstream media anymore but um they, they're really trying to censor citizen journalists because they really want to control the narrative and you're right the, the internet is the main way they're doing that and they've totally colonized facebook and youtube and google And it's only since Elon Musk took over Twitter that we've realized the depth of the colonization by what's sometimes called the deep state, FBI, CIA. I I presume Australia's government has a hand in things uh, in Australia and New Zealand. What we know, Jacinda Ardern said during the early days of the pandemic, you know, basically she said, trust us, trust everything we say, we'll be your source of all the news you want. 
and we know what's true. I know I'm paraphrasing there, but she yeah. really was shocking in terms of her hubris that only she knew the truth. Yeah, we used to mock the podium, which she stood behind and called it the podium of truth. But she actually said uh, not to trust anybody else other than the government and uh, that we're your one source of truth. She actually right, that's said the, that. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, the exact source. wording. I've seen that clip so many times. And the, the, the shocking thing, Cam, is how many New Zealanders said, okay. I mean, and I'm not blaming New Zealand, Canadians, Americans, Europeans. They did the same thing. I mean, there's an instinct in all of us. I think it probably dates back to prehistoric times, probably even to caveman times. Mm. Stick with the herd and you'll be safe. You can see it in, in nature. You know, fish swim in a school. Um, buffalo run in a herd. It makes you safer from the wolves, from the sharks. And I think that in a time of crisis and danger and fear and risk, there is a human instinct to just obey authority, stick with the herd, do what everyone else is doing, and you'll be safe. And I think that really came out during the pandemic. And we saw people lusting for more government control. There were freedom fighters, yeah. to count you amongst them. Yeah. But for every freedom fighter, I have to say there were more people who sort of liked the comfort of having an authoritarian regime. And I find it a little embarrassing. Canada went that way, too. I mean, we in the province of Quebec, which is the French speaking part of Canada, yeah. They had actual curfews from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m., whether you were vaccinated or not, whether you were sick or not. And some people loved it. And no court ever struck that down as unconstitutional. That's another thing, is that the checks and balances in our democracies, they failed. Think about the checks and balances that we count on. Opposition parties who didn't oppose. No. courts that didn't strike these things down. The media were absolute propagandists. They weren't skeptical. Um, colleges of physicians and surgeons, like the regulators of doctors, any doctor who had a, quote, second opinion, that doctor was investigated. Or and, cancelled. It, you know, they, they were yeah. victimized just as much as, as the ordinary citizens were. In fact, more so, probably. Yeah, and, and it was to enforce a conformity um, give the illusion that everyone was fine with this because look, there's not a single doctor who objects. Yeah, because you've you've suspended the ones who don't. And I don't know. I I think it showed some real cracks in our intellectual democratic, you know, ability to think through crises. And and some people I, I see news in America that they're talking about bringing back masks again. In fact, we see the first institutions talking about masks just for 14 days. And I know that too many people will embrace that. I think more people will be skeptical this time, but there will be people who embrace it. And look, Dan Andrews was reelected, if I recall. And, you know, I, I, I don't know enough about New Zealand politics to comment, but in many Canadian jurisdictions, the locker downers were reelected. Justin Trudeau, who many people have compared to Jacinda, yeah. uh, are doing Justin Trudeau was reelected. And in the Canadian provinces, the ones with, with uh, you know, one exception, the ones who were the locker downers were reelected. So they believe not only were they right, but they believe that the people support them. And I have to say there's some truth there is that maybe we're not yeah. as freedom loving as, as like, I really want to believe that human beings yearn for freedom. But I think what the pandemic showed us is that many of our friends and neighbors yearn for, quote, security. They yearn for control. And, you know, we saw this here in New Zealand. Jacinda Ardern, we've got an electoral system that was designed, you know, was designed actually at the end of World War II to prevent majority parties taking complete control of the parliament in Germany. New Zealand adopted the MMP system. And, you know, for 30 years, we didn't have one party getting a majority. So they had to form coalitions. You know, people were sold on the story that they would then be collaborative and it would be all, you know, motherhood and apple pie and the politicians would get on together. Well, Jacinda Ardern, the lockdown princess, uh, managed to get the rear feet of an absolute majority under MMP. And then she really went to town. 
yeah. was uh, w- which obviously culminated in the parliamentary protests, which echoed the truckers' convoy uh, that you had in in Canada. And um, but that actually in New Zealand was the beginning of the end of Ardern because that protest of those courageous people who had lost jobs, had lost their houses, their friends, their families, their careers, had nothing left to lose, all turned up at Parliament and protested. And that's when Jacinda Ardern started to realise that not everyone was on board with her kindness, you know, that she used to call it. Yeah, and and some of these leaders started to convince themselves that everyone agreed because – First of all, they, they weren't going out and about in regular gatherings. They weren't on the mm-hmm. hustings. They weren't at town hall meetings because the gatherings were all shut down. So the only person, so it, so in their defense, and I think that a lot of them knew exactly what they were doing, but in their defense, if I had to explain things from their side, I would say they were in these cocoons where everyone agreed. And perhaps you're right, perhaps seeing those protesters shocked her to oh maybe not everyone agrees and in canada where the trucker convoy was i estimate that that there were tens of thousands of truckers a hundred maybe a hundred thousand other people who protested Mm. in solidarity but i believe that fully one million people observed firsthand part of the trucker convoy they they literally came out on the sides of highways to just to watch and be part of a grassroots movement. They wanted to see with their own eyes, not through the filter of their cell phone. Yeah. And, and it was breaking that false consciousness of unanimity. We were told everyone agrees. Everyone loves us. Everyone's with. And it was only when, and and by the way, just like those protests, you say they were the beginning of the end for Ardern. In Canada, the trucker convoy was absolutely the beginning of the end of lockdown. In Canada, Trudeau overreacted. He brought in a form of martial law yeah. called the Emergencies Act, which, by yeah. the way, he hadn't even invoked during 9-11. So 9-11 was An not act of a terrorism. Yeah, yeah. An act, act of terrorism wasn't, you know, the airspace over the continental United States and Canada shut down completely. But no, we don't need to use the Emergencies Act for that. But these pesky people who are protesting – yeah, we've got to subject them to the awesome and fearsome powers of the state. And that's exactly what Jacinda Ardern did here. She'd had enough of the protesters peacefully camped on the front lawn of Parliament and um, brought in the stormtroopers, you know, and all their black gear, their helmets, their shields, their batons, their tear gas. Um, they even had baton rounds, you know, that uh, they call them sponge rounds, but, they're, you know, these are less than lethal but hurt nonetheless firearms mm-hmm. that the police were using against unarmed citizens. And, the, and, the, and they, they dreamed up, you know, the media was in and on, you know, they would put a press release out and say, pitchforks have been seen at the protest. Well, after, mm-hmm. the, after the protest, when everything was wrecked and destroyed by the police, there was no firearms displayed. There was no weapons displayed. There was no pitchforks displayed. Normally, you know, when you see the police um, do a raid on somebody, they display all of the evidence mm-hmm. that they've gathered. We had none of that. Mm-hmm. We had none of that. We had all these people prosecuted for trespassing yeah. in a public area. It was incredible. You know, it's the same in Canada, the trucker convoy. There was not a single violent act ascribed to the trucker convoy. There was one shooting, but it was Trudeau's Mounties shooting our reporter, Alexa Lavoie, with one of those less than lethal riot Mm. guns. So there was a single shooting during the entire trucker saga, and it was a cop shooting our reporter. And I have to think, what are the odds? A million people participating in some way, 100,000 in a deeper way, and maybe 10,000 actual real truckers. And the only shooting was a Trudeau Mountie shooting a Rebel News reporter Maybe it was just coincidence, but boy, it sure felt personal. What astonishes me, Ezra, about this whole pandemic uh, nightmare, really, is that how quickly Western democracy succumbed to totalitarianism. It's as if we never learned anything from the 1930s, a a scant 75 years ago, 80 years ago, and we've totally forgotten all of those lessons. And and I've I've commented often that Joseph Goebbels must be 
cackling in his grave that his treatise on propaganda had been picked up by Trudeau, by Dan Andrews, by Jacinda Ardern, and implemented flawlessly, and we all fell for it. Well, that's the thing. I mean, Nazi Germany, um, well, Hitler came to power in 1933, and he had to change many of the laws and the culture of Germany to bend to his plans. The Nuremberg Laws of 35, if I'm not mistaken. The Enabling um, a little Act. Bit lit- yeah. And so it was a series of things. It took really six years to get into the Second World War, and the Holocaust itself didn't really get fully underway for a couple more years. That, you know, I mean, Germany was really one of the most enlightened, progressive, educated, liberal places in the world. I th- I mean, obviously, thank God, um, Canada, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand did not, you know, we, obviously, we didn't go full Nazi. Mm. But boy, we sh- we sure Not went close. to lockdown and mandatory um, vaccinations and and people accepting the fact that churches and synagogues were locked down, people accepting limits on funerals and weddings. And, you know, I'm, of course, we didn't go the, the whole distance, thank God. But boy, we sure went a long way very quickly. And, and I'm not comparing uh, them other than when you go down the road of authoritarianism, I think we went rather quickly. And part of it was our, I think there's a, I think people always think that the modern era is the most enlightened and somehow they're maybe even genetically more moral people than those in history, but that's clearly not true. If anything, I don't think we're as literate in the philosophy of freedom. And, and of course the media is much more controlled. Goebbels uh, could never have dreamed of controlling the media in the manner that social media companies like Facebook, YouTube, Google, et cetera, did. I mean, literally automated machine learning censorship yeah. of even of, and if you read the community guidelines of YouTube to this day, they don't say violating the quote science. Cause what does that mean? They say yes. violating health orders of different authorities. So basically it's a political censorship. They, and and by the way, a lot of their so-called science uh, or uh, community guidelines were later proved to be false. And Goebbels yeah. never had that control. The Soviets had a- enormous control. In Romania, They you had to literally register your typewriter with the police. They would take a typing sample because each typewriter had a slightly yeah, different yeah. fingerprint. And they would keep those on file in case they found anti-government Sam is that, and they would try and see, well, whose typewriter was used in this? Like, that's how authoritarian and controlling they were, but they had nothing on the modern high tech social media censorship industry. Goebbels could never have dreamed of the censorship that the, um, the modern era has. And this is the thing that, that shocks me to my core. And, and people say, well, why do you say shock, Kim? That's that's really strong language you're using, but I never could understand why the Jewish community never fought back in in Nazi Germany. I could never understand how it ended in the camps and the death and the destruction of that and how they got there. And it wasn't until I visited Jerusalem in, in 2014 and I went to Yad Vashem and that museum is incredible uh, because it teaches you as you journey through the galleries precisely how it happened and how it happened in an incremental way. Right. It, it, the, 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 the death camps didn't just happen. They were right. the end of a very long process that started with segregating people on the basis of something, in this case, their Jewishness, wearing right. wearing a gold star. And we very quickly in modern society ended up with the modern equivalent of a gold star, which was the reverse of that, but the, the vaccine passes and preventing people going to see shows or going to restaurants or congregating together unless they had their pass. Yeah. And it, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was criticized for drawing that parallel. Uh, well, and the reason you were and, criticized and by, is because it was... liberal Jews as well. They yeah. criticized me for saying that. But I said, but the, these are all the hallmarks. 
We yeah. are stepping closer and closer to totalitarianism, and no one's fighting except a few of us. Yeah. The reason you were criticized for making that analogy was because it hit home. And by the way, after the Second World War, the Nazi doctors who committed uh, uh, atrocious experiments mm. on concentration camp uh, inmates, uh, a lot of the Nazi doctors were put on trial. Mm. And one of the verdicts of that trial has been called the Nuremberg Code. Yeah. And it codifies how you need a patient's consent before doing medical experiments on them. And it's called the Nuremberg Code, and you can find it quite quickly. Mm. It, it, it was part of the verdict on these Nazi doctors. And the Nuremberg Code talks about informed, continuous consent. Yeah. The consent that can be revoked. Informing they have to know the risk in advance. The Nuremberg Code was violated. And anyone who says, oh, people have a choice, if someone has a job that they need to feed and house their family, and you say, yeah. take the jab or you'll be fired. That it's is no not choice. free consent. That's not that's not real consent. It's, it's coercion. And, um, and by the way, don't think for a second that we had full informed consent. How could we, since the drugs were experimental and still are, by the way? Mm. They're required to be under testing for years to come. We don't know what the long-term effects are. So so the fact that people would say, How dare you compare it to the Nuremberg Code? Well, because it's exactly what the Nuremberg Code was designed to militate against. And I think, um, it, it, yes, it was the incremental uh, incrementalism. People said, oh, well, I can get along without that. Okay, so so we have to have six feet of separation. Okay, so we have to uh, limit that. You know, I think you mentioned that the vaccine passport was analogous to the Jewish star. I would say in a slightly different way, the mask was. Yeah. Here's what I mean yeah. by that. Wearing the mask perpetuated a psychology of fear and crisis. Where there was none. The fact that the mask uh, has been proved en endlessly not to be particularly effective, and in some cases to be actually retrograde, was beside the point. The mask was the flag of the pandemic in two ways. It kept everyone reminded that we are in a crisis. If there were no masks um, and you had no media, you wouldn't believe it's a crisis at all. You'd say, oh, it's a bad flu season. Mm. But the mask was a way of constantly terrorizing you, making you nervous. And it was also a flag that you flew if you were a supporter of the new way. Um, where's your mask? That you if you're complied. not lying. Yeah. And, and so the Jewish star obviously had the reverse. It was segregating you, it was putting you into the hated group. But having the Jewish star also perpetuated the normalization of segregating and demonizing minorities. So... Uh, you know, there's some Jews who are visibly Jewish. They would wear traditional black hats and yeah. yarmulkes and whatever. But by forcing every Jew, the most secular Jew, for example, to wear a yellow patch, that normalized segregation in the larger community. It was a psychological warfare, not just against the Jews to have them internalize their minority status but for the rest of society oh those are bad people those are different people this is normal that we segregate against them and so it was a psychological mm. weapon of mass propaganda and the bringing the masks back in has exactly the same impact and the fact that some people to this day embrace the masks as part of their personality i find deeply sad it's incredibly sad but I don't know if you ever saw Jacinda Ardern when she, I won't say she was confronted, it was more of, of an ask by a journalist in a rather benign way. And he said, well, hang on a second, you know, by having these vaccine passes and having, uh, you know, regulations in place that prevents unvaccinated people from doing things, aren't you creating two classes of citizens, the vaccinated and the unvaccinated? And she just cackled towards this journalist and said, yes, that is what it is. That's exactly what it is. And she, without even a, a shred of humility or embarrassment, just laughed it off that, yes, we were going to segregate people and we were going to do it this way. And this is what astonishes me the most, is that the people who were the happiest at imposing segregation and breaching civil rights and doing all of the things that we've just talked about, were actually the political left who typically fight for human rights and civil rights. And now they were actually 
you know, jack booted little statists that were dancing all over those rights. I could yeah. I couldn't believe it. And to this day I still can't believe that they did that. Well, in Canada, we have a variety of political parties. And for example, the NDP, that's our socialist party. They believe in union members and solidarity forever and collective bargaining. But they, that party sold out their union members by agreeing to require uh, vaccines in their collective agreements without a re- renegotiation, without a strike. Many of them refused to grieve their members being firing. So those people were politically homeless. The Green Party, which was about skepticism of big pharma and natural health, suddenly they were for big pharma and a mandated jab. Uh, the Liberal Party in Canada, which is sort of the mainstream left, slightly left party, their central credo is my body, my choice. Keep your hands off my body. You mm. know, they're, they're talking about abortion and other things like that. But suddenly they were fine with a mandatory jab. So, yes, every party sold out their heritage to join in this madness. And, you know, it reminds me of that poem poem by Kipling yes. called If. And I bet you know that poem. It's a I very do. famous yeah. poem. Let me read the first line. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, like that's the very first line in the poem. If, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. And it's just such a wonderful poem. It's a little bit Zen and, but people didn't keep their head. They panicked and they, there was a collective madness and, um, Every party sold out their, their base, I think. And uh, in, in the United States, you had some states uh, led by some courageous dissenting uh, politicians, Governor mm. uh, DeSantis of Florida being a key example. Exactly. At least in the United States, you had 50 different approaches and their Supreme Court weighed in. There was one wonderful case. The state of California um, banned singing in churches because they thought that would spread the virus. And that was quickly appealed, and the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on it quite quickly. Mm. And it's a beautiful decision. I don't have it in front of me, but you you should find it. And it's a very easy read. What I love about those U.S. Supreme Court decisions is how easy they are. There's there's not a lot of jargon in them. And there was this one line um, about how if the governor could have exemptions for shows like American Idol and, you know, America's Got Talent, that involves singing, they had to give the same exemptions for churches. As in, the Supreme Court said that, yes, the governor has the power to limit freedom in a crisis, but he can't pick and choose. And so whatever leniency he's giving his Hollywood friends, he has to give to the churches. Obviously, the ruling was much more you know, mm. judiciously written than that. But isn't that the truth? So you had some pockets of, and, and some countries, frankly, um, Countries that were poor countries that couldn't afford the luxury of shutting down the economy, um, they had some of the best health outcomes, believe it or not. And Sweden had one of the best health outcomes. I just just think, though, that I don't think most countries learned the right lessons from all this. Anyway, I'm talking, we've talked a lot about the pandemic, but I tell you, just look at the headlines today. The United States of America, it seems like almost... (laughs) <laughs> uh, they, they all saw the bat signal together and they're moving back towards masks again. It's madness. Yeah. They're just touching on that Supreme Court um, uh, decision that you mentioned, Justice Amy Coney Barrett uh, actually said, if a chorister can sing in a Hollywood studio but not in her church, California's regulations cannot be viewed as neutral. Good for you. That sounds like you found the exact I reason. found it, that, yeah. yeah that, that's that's beautiful. A, and it's not a very long ruling. I recommend everyone read it. You'll find you'll find it very um, thoughtful. I and and what's the date on that, uh, Cam? Um, like uh, that was fairly early. Yeah, that's February February twenty twenty one. That's pretty quick. That's like that's with like remember they didn't yeah so that's less than a year. Yeah. Um. You know. By the way, Canada things got desperately worse in 2021, and 2022 was the was the invocation of that martial law called the Emergencies Act. So, sorry, uh, in 2022 that was February 2022 was the worst. So yeah. America started to at least parts of America started Push to back. pull out of the madness earlier. Yeah. yeah. It, this is the thing that astonished me in New Zealand. 
the first lockdown that we had, when the Prime Minister came on the television and told everybody that they were going to be locked down, that you weren't allowed to talk, she actually said not to talk to your neighbours. Um, yeah, you know, Stay in your house, do this. Uh, we had the police commissioner come on television and saying that if you don't stay in your house, you'll be staying in our house. And it was a little, with a little wry grin on his face. Yeah, yeah. It was myself and another journalist, uh, Barry Soper, who leaked uh, the internal police legal opinion of the lockdown orders that said that the first lockdown was illegal. And mm. we were hounded, uh, abused, uh, said we were putting people at risk by sharing that information. The government denied that the legal um, opinion existed, even though I actually had, uh, you know, uh, a brave person inside the police leaked that information and the internal correspondence to me. So then I was able to actually ask for the documents because I knew what the file name was of them, but they still denied initially that this existed. And then when uh, another person, uh, a qualified lawyer, took the government to court, the court said, well, yes, all right, Um it, it perhaps was illegal, but it was the right thing to do. And they just glossed over law breaking by the government. And the same thing happened with Avi's case. Again, I was leaked documents that showed there was a political angle to trying to stop him coming to this country. And they were even in, uh, using international resources to try and do that with Interpol. And when we, when I released those documents, Again, I was attacked that, oh, these are fake. It's not real. You know, and, and we had conversations, you and I and Avi, uh, about these documents, and we proved that they were real, that it was using the Interpol, um, you know, secure system. But they yeah. they, they just broke the law, and they yeah, didn't and, care. Yeah, they didn't care. And, yeah, and listen, I mean, I I think that freedom was on the march in the 90s. I think mm-hmm. the early at the early years of the internet were some of the freest places and occasions yeah. in world history, and unfortunately, it's swinging back. You know, Rebel News. Um, we recently published Avi's autobiography. We also published another book recently um, that we did not, not write. Um, it's nineteen eighty four by George Orwell. That book is in the public domain now because yeah. the author has been passed away for a certain period of time. So like Shakespeare, his works are in the public domain. Yeah. So we republished 1984. We commissioned some new illustrations to make it a beautiful version. I really recommend that people reread that book. I think a lot of people read that book in high school, but really haven't seen it since then. That book was written in 1949. So after the, the horrors of the Nazi regime, yeah. but also as the as the reality of the Soviet regime was becoming known. This was four years after when when the Soviet had decided to stay mm. in Poland and Romania and Germany, et cetera. And so Orwell saw the similarity between national socialists and the international socialists. And he saw the tools. He, he talked in the book about what he called telescreens, mm. TVs that were always on, always pumping you propaganda, but also watching you. Well, how is that anything other than the uh, prediction of our own phones? He talked about new speak, a kind of language that was hidden double meanings. And it was really, well, remember, he called the Ministry of Propaganda the Ministry of Truth. He yeah. called the Ministry of Rationing the Ministry of Plenty. The Ministry of War was renamed the Ministry of Peace. So Orwell saw it. He saw it early. He saw that it was right and left. And he saw the power of conformity. And he saw also this is wonderful theme in 1984 of how intellectuals often were the vanguard of evil. And he had that phrase, the proles would say, yeah, this is in the proletariat, because there are some ideas so crazy, only a PhD can believe them. And again, who saved us in Canada? The truckers, yeah. working the workers. class truckers and ordinary people saved us. Whereas you find me a, a professor. Was there a single professor in New Zealand, Cam, who 
who had intellectual authority. And, you know, professors are quoted on TV all the time. They're kind of intellectual priesthood. You tell me, I don't know the answer to this. Was I there think, a single yeah, there was, establishment intellectual academic who spoke out? Yeah, there was a couple, but the problem with speaking out is that they only ever got to do it once, and then they were never invited back onto the onto the mainstream media. And so then we had, a, you know, a, a, a conga line of approved professors. We had, you know, of course, we had the famous uh, Dr. Susie Wiles, the woman with the pink hair, who is a, a microbiologist who studies glowing plankton, and here she was telling people you know, about masks and masks are important and vaccines and vaccines are important. And, all that. and they had the useful idiots that trotted out fanciful computer scenarios that were all based on that flawed Imperial College um, model that they used that, you know, had huge numbers of people who would die if we didn't do all of these things and scared everybody. But there were some honourable ones like Professor Des Gorman who said, well, this is kind of crazy. It doesn't kind of match the science that I'm seeing and all that. Well, he was just sidelined. We had doctors that came out and said something. They actually had to form their own organisation, um, you know, doctors speaking out about science and things like that. But they were marginalised and it was only the advent of Voices for Freedom, uh, you know, a, a protest group organised by three ladies who have been attacked constantly since doing that, you know, described by the disinformation project, the the mandarins appointed by the government to point the figure and say this is misinformation or dis. They describe these people as oh, well, they're knitters and they're traditional wives and they braid their hair and they put you know, this crazy stuff that's supposed to identify conspiracy theorists who are going down the rabbit hole, and and that's. The pandemic might be over, but the lessons that the governments of the world learned are still being applied, and they're creating these disinformation projects. They're trying to change laws in the United Nations, in the WHO. In New Zealand, we've got the Department of Internal Affairs that wants to monitor and control um, news media, Um, only have people who are registered, licensed news media who submit to the regulations of the state being able to obtain funding, it's all about control. And they, they've they just moved, and they've moved from the pandemic into climate change now, and they're going to try and apply yeah. the, the same rules. Again, yeah. none of the science yeah. is supported. Oh, yeah. um, you know, what, what you're talking about, licensing journalists, mm. you know, if, if you are a government-approved journalist, and they use the word trusted journalist, trust? Trusted, yeah. By whom? Um, the answer is always trusted by the regulators, which means trusted by the government. And we're all supposed to be fact checkers. Every journalist is a fact checker in their own way. And the thing is, even once they've, they've done their work, it, it's up to us as citizens to be the final arbiter of what's true or not. And that sounds difficult, but think about it. That's what really an election campaign is. You have two mm. clashing worldviews. And by the way, they both can be legitimate, yeah. but on, but you have to be able to disagree with what, you know, one guy's fact is another guy's um, misinformation. I, I do believe that there is objective truth in the world. I'm not a complete moral relativist who says things are only what you imagine. I believe there is truth in the world of physics and math, but on social sciences and matters like global warming and matters like the pandemic, we don't have all the information. The truth is not yet found out. I believe in the theory of gravity. I believe that is absolutely true. But very few things in politics are that clear. And so we have to allow humans, ordinary citizens, to be the judges of it and and not, quote, experts, experts who got so many things wrong. And that's what terrifies me about these so-called misinformation units. Mm. They're not made by superhumans. They're, they're not superior beings. And they would just be called journalists or pundits or opposition war room, you know, uh, political tricksters. But they call themselves misinformation units to give them some sort of special status. They're not. They are no better than you and me. But they have the, some sort of power over the rest of us, or at least they seek it. Yeah, and 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 it's spreading. That you know, we're seeing this constantly now. Whenever there, it's like us here at Reality Check Radio. The the mantra of all of the hosts that are on on Reality Check Radio is to explore all sides of an issue. And to let people talk and to have 
what I call, uh, you know, in the, at the start of this show, what I call uh, courageous discourse, where you can discuss something and disagree with somebody, but not be so polarized as to put your fingers in your ears and start screaming la, 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 which is what we are seeing constantly now in the United States, uh, certainly in Canada, in New Zealand and Australia, in the UK, where this polarization of society into an us and them, and, the, and there's so many us's and so many them's that they all sort of overlap each other. But what it's leading to is the loss of the ability to accept that somebody else may believe something different. You know, Cam, I'm, uh, I'm 51 years old, so it's been a while since I was in college. But when I was in university about 30 years ago, there were debates all the time. Uh, students love to watch debates on the issues of the day. Mm. And it, it wasn't, it was sort of expected that you would attend such a debate if you were in with a political club or a debating club. And if you said, no, I'm not going to debate you, you were a spoil sport, you were a chicken. Yeah. Um, you were not participating in the social, um, you know, uh, ebbs and flow, the social process. But those days are gone. Think of, about transgenderism. Yeah, yes. Think about climate change. On both of those, um, there is a censorship. You're called a, quote, denier, or you're called a transphobe, or you're called um, you a know, racist. conspiracy theory. Yeah, racist. So whereas when I was in college 30 years ago, there were rollicking debates all the time, and you were sort of, if you were a serious person, you uh, if you wanted to be taken seriously as a thinker, as an activist, you you loved these debates. You wished you were invited. If you weren't invited, you were set your own up. That is gone. And yeah. now you have br brittle students who not only don't see any debates, but they don't believe debates are a good thing. They certainly couldn't win a debate or participate because that involves having your own ideas challenged and formulating defenses and using logic and facts. What I see now is just people repeating mantras. And it's actually amazing to see what happens when people who go through the woke academies are subjected to criticism or skepticism or another point of view. They have a sort of breakdown. Um, they lash out with name calling and, and sometimes they call for the police. And, and I think we've, I think that that's part of the problem. Let me say this about the lockdowns, Cam. Yeah. Um, that was a long time coming. There were a lot of erosions in our checks and balances that had happened years or even decades earlier that allowed that to happen. Yeah. Our lack of understanding of the importance of fundamental freedoms, our lack of commitment to free speech, our lack of, uh, um, you know, there was a lot of things that had to go wrong a lot before 2020 for us to make the mistakes we did. And I think some of them can be traced back to education and that we, we, you know, we have the idea of trigger warnings instead of yeah. saying kids go to school and you will be triggered. You will hear uncomfortable thoughts. You will meet people who shock you with their ideas. And now you're going to practice responding to it. But universities are conformity factories. High schools are becoming that way. And they're, they're even reaching earlier. So a lot of these problems go up. It, it was a 30 year, 30 years of uh, the wrong direction got us into these problems. It's going to take 30 years to get us out, Cam. I think it's going to take longer than that. And I'll give you a, a classic example is uh, just two days ago, the government here, the Labour government, announced a new approach to education, particularly for important subjects like mathematics. And this mm -hmm. is this is a direct quote from uh, what they're wanting to achieve. Just to give you an example, it's quoted as a critical maths pedagogical approach uses maths to develop critical awareness about wider social, environmental, political, ideological, and economic issues. Critical mm -hmm. maths recognizes the importance of understanding, interpreting, and addressing issues of power, social justice, and equity in the community and the wider world. Then it uses the Maori word for students, a conga, uh, are encouraged to interrogate dominant discourses and assumptions, including that maths is benign, neutral, and culture-free. 
that's what that's what the the government of New Zealand wants to happen in the maths curriculum in New Zealand. Yeah, it's very interesting. I I just you know I'm worried about if you're taking a a Marxist uh, cultural Marxist approach to things like math. Mm. I fear for the, you know, I'm worried about our bridges and our uh, tunnels and our airplanes uh, in the years to come. I don't care what race or religion my doctor is or my pilot is. I just want them to be the best at it. I'm nervous about that. And frankly, our geopolitical competitors must be laughing. I think of China, where they're very much emphasizing. I reckon they're fermenting it. Oh, it wouldn't surprise me because it undermines the West. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's obvious in places like the military, when the military, I I mean, uh, not only in personnel decisions, but in doctrine and priorities, Mm. you know, to have a climate friendly military. I'm not even kidding. Uh, I remember Barack Obama's CIA director telling Charlie Rose that one of the reasons they didn't attack the ISIS oil uh, trucker tankers is because of climate change because of the environment. I'm not even kidding. So they, they didn't, I mean, you can find that on Charlie Rose, just Google Charlie Rose. Um, and anyway, it was Obama's CIA director. Yeah. I, he just said that with a straight face that he would rather not blow up an ISIS oil tanker because, you know, like these were murdering terrorists, you know, the worst people in the world, but we, we can't have an explosion because that's against global warming. That, I, I mean, I don't know if that's true, but the CIA director said it was true. I have trouble believing that the CIA actually thought that way. I, but if the director said they did, I, maybe they did. That's oh, yeah. crazy. And America's going to lose a war one day if that's how it is, because China they don't is care. not messing around. They're not they messing care. around. Yeah, yeah, they don't care. They, they, they uh, have got a thousand, two thousand, ten thousand year plan, and and all we do in the West is focus on electoral cycles of three, four, or five years, and uh, the Chinese just laugh at us. But you know, you've arrived here in New Zealand right in the middle of an election campaign. You must find it kind of amusing that in twenty twenty three we've got a governing party, the Labour Party, that's using a slogan that the NDP in Canada used in 2019, unsuccessfully, I might point out. Um, They've got exactly the same slogan. You might not have seen it yet. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm not not surprised. Um, I I think one of the attributes of uh, left-wing parties is that they have a globalist approach. You know, I mean, Jacinda Ardern was, as you know, uh, the head of a socialist international youth in her day. And And a a lot of these folks... And a WEF graduate. I was just going to say those were the next words out of my mouth <laughs> is why do Justin Trudeau and Jacinda Ardern and so many of these and Emmanuel Macron is they really synchronize with other leftists and they do on issues, whether it's global warming or censorship. That's what scares me. Jacinda Ardern is not done. In no, fact, no. she's she's on to bigger things. She wants to be a global censor. She wants to export that. And there are going to be governments like my own, that are receptive to it. Yeah. And, um, it, yeah. but that's, that, that's why I'm glad you're fighting the hard, the good fight, Cam. And, yeah. and in our own, I think everyone can be a citizen journalist. And Twitter, thank God, gives us a platform for it. And hopefully it will not become a 1984 future. We're already halfway down that road, but, you know, you got to keep hope alive. Well, that, and as they used to say in Germany in the war, hope dies last. But there's another slogan that I think that we need to do for those of us who are freedom fighters, those who are of us who are truth seekers. The Soviet Union used to have a slogan that they would indoctrinate people with was if you see something, say something. And I think I think we need to learn that from history, that if we see uh, the state doing something, that we say something about it that we we actually do what journalists are supposed to do and speak truth to power and not become the mouthpieces of the regime because the path that we're on now uh, with censorship, with control, with regulation, with all of those things, they just lead to subjugation of citizens. And we don't need to prove that that's the case. We have ample examples in history where 
uh, great civilizations have succumbed to bad ideas uh, over time. And, and that's what I see it's important for us here at Reality Check Radio and for you guys at Rebel News that we are the ones that are actually doing the journalism, not the the regime journalists, the regime uh, media that are doing it for the money that they get from the government. Well, let me say this, uh, Cam, to all your listeners. If you've got a cell phone, guess what? You can be a journalist. Yeah. It's that easy. You've got a camera. Uh, you can re- report the news. You can give your opinion. You can upload it to Twitter. Like You can be a journalist. And never before in the history of man has the barrier to entry been so low. Um, in earlier eras, you on the TV side, you would need expensive cameras and a broadcasting hub mm-hmm. and a license. Or, I mean, you don't need that now. And on the, on the written side, you would need a printing press and a distribution service. You don't need that now. You can be a journalist today for free with the tools that you have. Yeah. And you can do it as a living or you can do it as a hobby outside you. I would frankly recommend starting off, people start off with it as a hobby because, you know, it's very difficult to make a a living out of it, but you can. In fact, now Twitter is paying contributors based on the amount of uh, traffic they get. So you act, I've seen some people actually make a living wage just out of tweeting if they're interesting and entertaining and informative. So I would encourage people and people ask me all the time, how do I do it? How do I start? You just got to wake up in the morning and put your slippers on and get into it. That's right. My number one piece of advice would be do it every day. Yeah. Because first of all, if you don't have something to say every day, maybe you should know that. And maybe you just need to scratch an itch. But if you are good at it, you'll get better every day. And people will, I think as people will know that you're doing it every day, people will start to form a habit. They'll say, oh, what's he saying today? I know he's got a hot take. I'll take it today. So, um, and by the way, Twitter is great for that because it doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be a lengthy thing. It could be very short. And so it, it's, go ahead, Cam. Yeah, well, we're seeing that right now in New Zealand where there's a, a guy who uses a pseudonym because He's in a in a job that he doesn't want to risk, and so he has to use a pseudonym. His, his Twitter handle is Thomas Cranmer, and he uh, seems to be very well connected, seems to know how to use the Official Information Act uh, very well, and he has revealed in the last couple of days a concerted campaign by the New Zealand government to purchase content that suits a narrative that they want to push out. And that narrative is quite broad in what he uh, has been exposing through these uh, through these documents. And uh, I sent you a link before we, we got started on this uh, interview, but basically the New Zealand government has approached a television station about a special partnership about climate change that they started on in May 2022, and then finally signed it after negotiations so that they could time it with COP27. Now, you've sent journalists to COP27, so you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. They've spent $400,000 or so with, this is just one news organization that we know about, uh, oh, and a second one, Stuff, the the largest internet uh, news site in New Zealand. And they've been paying for content to push an agenda that also involved government ministers appearing on television shows to push that agenda. And you know what's really strange about this, Ezra? Hmm. The only people talking about us, uh, people on, about this, are people, people on Twitter or Reality Check Radio, uh, another independent media outlet called The Platform. The mainstream media today, you, I would have thought that would be big news, you know, that here yeah. we have c- cash for content uh, arrangements in place with media. The Herald, New Zealand Herald said nothing. There's nothing on the stuff. The main ch- major TV channels have said nothing. The major commercial radio stations have said nothing about it. Total well, silence. And first of all, I'm, I'm shocked, but not surprised because mm. the same thing is happening in Canada. And we did an access to information request in Canada mm. seeking the list of all the, uh, the media companies that received special bailouts and payments from Trudeau and the list, there were 1500 companies on the list. 
Cam, I didn't even know there were 1,500 media companies in all of Canada. Uh, everyone in the entire industry went to get their payoffs. Some it was tens of thousands. Some it was hundreds of thousands. Some it was millions. And here's the one thing these 1,500 titles have in common. Not a single one reported it. <laughs> because why would you disclose to your own viewers that you're really running infomercials for the regime? And if listeners are having trouble realizing why that's bad, imagine if it was, um, oh, I don't know, Exxon Mobil. And, yeah. and they just said, wink, wink, we have a particular view on global warming and carbon taxes. Or imagine if it was a tobacco company. Well, what about, and, oh, I don't know, Pfizer. Yeah. Oh, well, that, that's, <laughs> that's a huge and obvious one. And you know what, Cam, it's funny you say that. I don't know if you saw, but in January, Avi Amini and I, with a couple of the journalists, went to Davos, I Switzerland, did. for the World Economic yeah. Forum. And we literally chanced upon Albert Bourla, the Pfizer CEO, on the street. Yeah. And I couldn't believe it. And we we jumped into action. We, we walked with him for about three minutes till he managed to duck out. And we peppered him with questions. He didn't really answer them, although I think he could have. Like, it surely wasn't the first time he heard those questions, but he just thought himself above answering them. That video was the uh, first time, I think, that that Albert Buehler was scrummed like that by anybody. Yeah. Now, he, he, yeah. does, he does media interviews one, two, All three, time. four times a day. Not, not so much today, but back then he did. Mm. And so what that showed was not just people pummeling Burla with questions, and I, I thought some of our questions were good, but it was a wake up call that hang on, why has no one else ever done this to Burla? We were not rude, we didn't. No, I, I, mean, saw, I saw the videos, you know, you were very, I mean, it's the thing, Ezra, you're always exceptionally polite. In well, I wouldn't they, go that far, I, I disagree with that, <laughs> but but we, they were substantive questions, yeah, politer I mean, than we, me, you put it that way. <laughs> well, we poked, we poked him. He didn't say anything, but the fact that Avi and I pummeled him for three minutes was, a, I think, that I, the reason I tell you that, Cam, is that was our most popular video we have ever made in our nine years. Yeah. That video has been seen more than any other of our videos, 20 million times alone on Twitter. Yeah. And the reason I say that is you would never have seen those questions on, by the New Zealand Herald, by stuff by in america cnn, CNN yeah. or, or even fox or yeah. even fox they would have been much more careful because you don't bite the hand that feeds you and there was a multi-billion dollar sales effort going on and pfizer is a major sponsor of media major advertiser major sponsor and if you wonder why you never saw albert burla scrummed by anyone else other than Avi Amini and myself, two citizen journalists, neither of whom went to journalism school, neither of whom work for a big regime media. Yeah. It's because of what you just pointed out here in New Zealand. These secret payments. And of course, Cam, this revelation is not being reported because they're all in on it. They are all in on it. It is a club and you are not invited. And and this is a criticism that comes up about yourself, Avi. Uh, Rukshan, that you are, because you are able to do those things, you know, through fair means or foul, people say that Rebel News is controlled media, that you were actually given access at Davos and you was, it was just so that there could be, a, you know, look like that there was some, uh, some opposition media there and that actually you're just grifters. And how, how do you cope with? those constant criticisms of rebel news, your business model, how you do, you know, in interviews like that, where you're trying to get Albert Baller to talk and yet yeah. you're accused of being controlled media um, that yeah. are actually I, on the side of the state. I mean, I, it would annoy sure, the hell out of me if it was said to me. I saw it. I saw a few people say that about that Bourla interview. Like I said, 20 million people saw that on Twitter alone. Mm. And I saw a few people saying, that must have been set up. Yeah. Well, let me just give you some background. We we went to the World Economic Forum in Davos. We were not given credentials. Yeah. We were standing outside the security perimeter. We were not allowed to go in. All the VIPs are in. It's like a castle with a drawbridge, really. Yeah. yeah. And we we are out on the street. It was cold. 
it was it was very cold and basically what we did all day was wait and try and catch people as they came and went i catch we caught john Kerry very quickly we mm. caught um uh brian kemp the governor of uh the state of georgia in the united mm. states uh we waited for two hours as greta thunberg uh tried to outweigh us um and then we actually walked with greta for 10 minutes and talked yeah. to her for 10 minutes i saw I that one too yeah and i thought her answers were silly and frustrating but at least she talked to us it was absolutely good luck that we caught burla because he the name tags are fairly small you've got to spot people or spot their name tags and then you've got to very quickly think of questions like tony blair i bumped into tony blair the british pm if you had five seconds to think of questions for him could you do it you'll, you'll notice when in the video of me scrumming burla I sort of ran out of questions after 30 seconds. And luckily, Avi jumped in because I, I, I wasn't ready to think, okay, what, what should I ask Pfizer? I think that was Albert Bourla's worst day of the year. And anyone who thinks that was set up, I think that's a, I mean, watch the video. I mean, I remember the questions I asked. I said, why did you keep it secret that your virus didn't stop transmissibility? Right? What, yep. I said, you knew it before you before you admitted it. Why did you decide to keep it secret? I'm sorry, that's a devastating question, if I do say so myself. We said, why did you lie about the efficacy? You said it was 90%, then 80%. So we said, um, will you apologize? Mm. How is that serving Pfizer's interest? I, I think I, one of us said something like, um, you know, or did you need a yacht or something? What do you think about when you're on your private jet or your yacht? <laughs> um, I think Avi said something about uh, returning money for, you know, uh, f you know, faulty products. We asked, we peppered them with the most vigorous question. I mean, if by the way, if someone has a tough question that they can think of that we didn't ask, I'd like to hear it. Yeah, that that we pummeled him, and I think he made it look worse because he didn't talk and we had and he tried to escape us as you saw he he tried to get out of the public street the whole thing was about three minutes long mm. uh, but it felt for him i'm sure like three hours no that was our that was a combination of luck and patience we waited and waited and we had no idea who we, we could get and we had to sort of spot their name tags. I mean, I, I recognized Albert Bourla because he's on TV so much. Yeah. But yeah. many of the names, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't have known Brian Kemp, the governor of Georgia. I just don't know what he looks like. So we had a team there whose job was to sort of spot name tags. And again, this was only for people who left the security perimeter. We were not allowed in any of the official venues. There are some sort of kiosks outside the official venues where we were allowed to go. But I walked into the BlackRock venue, and they basically shooed us out of there, and uh, they called security. Now, I didn't – I mean, I left the building. I didn't want to trespass. Yeah. I didn't want to be charged. By the way, I should tell you that Swiss police are very respectful of civil liberties. We were stopped a couple times by Swiss police, yeah. and we just said – we just said we're journalists. Uh, we, we have not broken the law. And they said, you're right. And they let us go. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I – I'm used to arguing with police in Canada, yeah, in the United Kingdom, and I've seen Avi do it in Australia. These Swiss police were as gentle as you could imagine, and they absolutely did not stop us from scrumming anyone. They, there were heavily armed police where we met Greta, where we met Albert Bourla, and they didn't do a thing. Yeah. Whereas I promise you, if that had happened in New Zealand, Canada, the UK, it Australia, wouldn't have got near them. You're right, and so I have to. And so let me say one more thing: it's hard to get to to Davos. You have to fly to Zurich, then take the train. The WEF books every single hotel room in the town of Davos. You yeah. cannot even stay in Davos. You have to stay one or two towns away and take the train or drive in every day. They make it very hard to get there from New Zealand. Is probably three thousand dollars to get there yeah. and and good luck finding an airbnb but if you get there it really is a festival of vvips it yeah. really is the greatest gathering 
of big shots in the world. And you're not going to get into their inner sanctum, but you will get on the street. So again, if there's a citizen journalist out there, I know what I just said about $3,000 to get there. That's Mm -hmm. a huge obstacle, but we crowdfund it. And so you talked about crowdfunding. Cam, the way I see it is there's three ways you can run a media company. One is uh, you can do what the New York Times and the Washington Post does. Get a benefactor. That's right. The richest man. A billionaire who's in on it. Yeah, it's right. Uh, Jeffrey Bezos of Amazon owns Washington Post. Carlos Slim. Yeah, or or, or Elon Musk for that matter. Yeah. So so a lot of oligarchs buy media as like a plaything. So you could work for a billionaire, and that's great as long as you do exactly what he says, you'll be fine. Another way is to work for a large corporate media. Trouble with that is they have ads to sell to Pfizer. And they're often exposed to public pressure through other companies in their conglomerate. So you can go to work for a corporate media company, but prepare to be very vanilla on all sides for the rest of your life. They'll be very woke. Another way is. um, Let your audience fund you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And Rebel News, the average donation to Rebel News is $58. Yeah, And so that means we have a lot of people chipping in, but it also means there's no one donor who's so big that he can call me up and say, Ezra, fire Avi. And if someone tried to phone me up and say, fire Avi, I would, I would say, oh, now I know that Avi's hitting the target. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and, and no one tries to do that because no. they know I'll, I'll re- react the opposite way. I, I, I didn't always work for a citizen funded company. I did work for an oligarch once. I worked for a, a TV station for a few years owned by a billionaire named Pierre Carl Pelado. The company was called Quebecor. Yeah. And it was wonderful. I didn't have to worry about making, making payroll. I got well paid. It was a great job. Um, I, I knew there were a few things I, I wouldn't talk about because it would upset the big man, but I was actually given a lot of free. Listen, I loved it. It's great work if you can get it, but just be prepared that if you di- if if your oligarch boss disagrees with you, you are going to be silenced. Now, m- maybe for some people they don't care; they just want a job. Maybe they're talking about sports or the weather, and they're really not controversial. But if you are a political commentator or a news reporter, if you're trying to speak truth to power, if you're trying to tell the contrarian side of the story, if you're a skeptic about anything mainstream, don't work for a conglomerate. And maybe you can find an oligarch who supports your point of view, but I'm not sure. I don't know a lot of them. They're so the only handcuffs, answer, though, aren't they? That's right. And and I work a lot harder now because we have to crowdfund every day. Mm. It's a lot harder than just showing up to work in a luxury studio. But I'm a lot freer, and it feels great. And I would encourage people um, – you know, to, to, to express themselves that way. I, I would warn them against trying to make a living out of this. I would warn people, yeah. start small, start as a hobby. But I would say it's been wonderful. And w- as long as I stay with the people, they're going to stay with me. That's what I believe. Yeah, and I'm exactly the same position. You know, it, my audience are the ones that I value, not any advertisers or or um, secret funders, not that I've got any. Um, you know. I just value the contributions that my audience provides me. And it can be as small as a comment saying, thanks for saying that. Thanks for interviewing Ezra. Thanks for doing that. Those, yeah. those are the things that matter the most to me. We've got subscribers. Uh, you know, they're the people that I listen to. And if they stop subscribing, that means I'm doing something wrong. And that's my yeah. that's my guidance that I have. If I look at the subscribers, if it's going up, I must be doing something right. If it's going down, I must be doing something wrong, and I go and correct it. And that's how newspapers started. You know, that's the thing. I, I was involved in a court case where I was being sued, and you know this very well. What it's like, you've been sued several times, like me. Um, I had a, a the person I was the protagonist up against me said, was claiming I wasn't a journalist, and I had to prove that I was a journalist to the judge. And um, yeah. and then when I did, and I said, "Well, here's all of my writing. Here's this. Here's that." And, you know, explained what pamphleteers. And then you know, started with typewriters, got printing presses, and et cetera. I'm just using the modern tools like you talked about before, cell phones and things like that. 
And, uh, you know, the, the protagonist then said, oh, but you're not a good journalist. And I said to the uh-huh. judge, I said to the judge, there's no requirement in the law to be a good journalist. You just have to be a journalist. And, uh, yeah. and I've got, I actually had to get a court judgment that's, that declared that I was a journalist, and that settled the argument. But I should never have had to have done that in the first place. Well, that's the times we're in these days. Uh, they want to regulate journalism as a kind of priesthood or profession so they can stop citizen journalists from talking back. Yeah. Well, Cam, it's a, pl- a pleasure to, to see you in action and to be on your show, and it's great to be in New Zealand. I'm I'm not over the jet lag. I just landed. No, this morning, you need a but, you uh, need a rest, and uh, and I've taken up more than enough of your time. But you enjoy. Oh, it's a pleasure, though. You enjoy the rest of the day, and we'll catch up in person on Friday for Arvi's book launch. I'm really looking forward to it. Looking forward to meeting you in person. Looking forward to meeting New Zealanders who are contrarian, who are nonconformist, who yep. want to know the other side of the story, and who believe in freedom. And I believe that New Zealand historically has been a place for freedom and frankly for nonconformists and and i hope that spirit can be rekindled and uh, that's the whole ethos of reality check radio and i think there's a a good alignment with what we're doing with what rebel news is doing and that's the reason why i wanted to have you on the show today well i'm very grateful to you and thanks for being such a supporter of avi and and what i would say to your listeners is even if you don't agree with avi The fact that he's there is healthy for public discussion. And it's in the public interest to have contrarian, troublemaking journalists. And it keeps politicians on their toes. It challenges sacred cows. And every once in a while, we get something right. And it makes a difference. And we were on the right side of... More often than not, Ezra, we get things right. More often than not. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for, for this, Cam. It's great to talk to you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Ezra. Cheers. Ezra has made a career of challenging the mainstream and politicians, and Rebels' fight against the excesses of the Trudeau regime in Canada is vitally important. That's why he's here in New Zealand to share details of that fight. Join us at Arvi's book launch in Auckland tomorrow and meet the three amigos in person. Do you think the same? Don't forget to send comments to inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy right here on RCR.